Hey guys, it's Justine. And I'm Jenna. Welcome to a new episode of the Same Brain Podcast. And today we have a very, very special guest. Let's roll that intro right now. So I'm very excited because today on the podcast, we have James Rath, who is a legally blind filmmaker. He, he's an editor. He also plays video games. And I first met him at E3. Because An incredible I've human. I've been watching his YouTube videos. So I kind of, I had a, like a fangirl moment. I was like, oh, it's James. And everything that he's been doing for the accessibility community is incredible. So I'm so excited to have him on the podcast today. All right, let's, let's Zoom call in to James. James, hello. Thank you so much for joining us on the Same Brain Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is amazing. So I was thinking like the other day, whenever I reached out to you about being on, I was like, your story is incredible. Everything that you've accomplished. And I just feel like I'm so honored to have you here, like chatting about sort of everything that you've been doing. So thank you again. Uh, I guess maybe do you want to start and just kind of tell us like a, a little bit about like your story, how you got started? Yeah. Uh, so I guess long story short, uh, I'm legally blind since birth and that has really help shape the way that I, I make content. I make videos, uh, I do some directing outside of YouTube, but YouTube has always been sort of like this home for me. I joined the platform when I was about 10 years old, uh, which is kind of wild to think about. And just really, I grew up with it. it. It was one of those things that's always been a place where I could just share my craft. And eventually people kind of asked me, your eyes look a little different. Uh, they're, they're shaking, they're, they're uh, involuntarily moving. And so I made a video talking about that. And, and eventually people who had a similar condition found it, saw it, we talked about it more, built a little community around that. And um, as I became an adult, I wanted to see what accessibility was like out there, like outside of what I grew up learning. And so YouTube just became this community where I was learning from other people with different disabilities and other people who come from different um, types of blindness. And it really became this, this educational community uh, that has really helped be a support um, system for me. And it's really helped shape an accessible adulthood for myself. And I think everything you've done too has really kind of helped creators kind of realize that we can be creating content more accessibly as well. Because, you know, normally I think we take a lot of these things for granted. So I think you and a lot of other people in the community have done such a great job of sort of like kindly educating us because it's like, if we don't know, it's like, how are we going to get better and to try to improve and create things? So is there any like tips that you have for creators that can help make more accessible content? Yeah. Uh, so like off the bat, one of the easiest things you can do, uh, which YouTube makes it fairly simple, uh, is captioning. Captioning is something that helps deaf and hard of hearing folks. Uh, it's great for non-English speakers, also helps with the SEO. So if you want to get into like the real technical of it, uh, every word in the transcript of your captions is counted towards metadata. So then that helps uh, the Google and YouTube search. And so if I mention a word in my video, that's going to kind of push the algorithm a little bit towards it. Um, along with that, you can, of course, start with a template of like the YouTube auto captions, but it's not great. And it's not uh, really standard. I, I would say it's it's not going to be of quality. So you can always go into YouTube's uh, editing captioner and essentially take that and just correct the grammar, add, um, you know, fix words that, that might be not the right word or even inappropriate words because it's, it's not perfect. But it's a good base to start from, especially if you want to caption for free. And then there's services out there uh, like Rev who partner with YouTube that uh, can caption your video for like $1.25 per minute. So yeah. I'm a huge fan of Rev. Oh, I too. actually think that you're the reason that I started using it because you talked about it a while ago and I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually think so too. Yeah. I will say the YouTube, the auto generated ones. I remember I, this might've been 2016. I would did a video like reacting to what YouTube thought I was saying. It was very, very <laughs> wrong and vulgar. And I was like, oh my gosh, is this what YouTube thinks I'm saying? And even since then, I feel like I've tried to like speak a little bit more clearly now, but also using, uh, you know, not not relying on just YouTube for the captions and using services like Rev has definitely been more helpful. Do you have a Rev affiliate link that we can share with the people? Uh, I, I do. Uh, I have to probably give that link for okay. a description or yeah, something. Yeah, no, send me the link and we can let people check it out. But it's honestly, I feel like for me as well, like it's, it's so easy and it's like the money that you're spending is it's definitely worth it to make it more accessible. And something that somebody once had told me like in the comments 
um, which I never even realized that I was sometimes doing is just trying to be more descriptive about like when you are unboxing or showing things like, what does it feel like? What does it actually look like? And kind of try to be more descriptive for people who aren't able to visually see what you're kind of explaining. So that was something that like, I'd never really thought about either. So I think for creators that could also be kind of a good tip. Yeah, that's something I try to even practice myself uh, based on like the visual information that I know uh, is is in front of me. Um, but yeah, and, and that's just, again, if there's text on screen, make sure it's like audibly uh, relayed, whether it's again, you or a narrator or text to speech or whatever it might be. Uh, so yeah, that's important, especially because a lot of people do now listen to YouTube videos. They'll either just put in another tab or for myself, I will just oftentimes use the mobile app with YouTube premium and just listen to videos. So, and so one thing I think that, you know, might be confusing to people is there's varying degrees of sort of blindness. So what can you like explain like what that's like and what most people, cause you see something, but you, you don't. So I'm unsure how to even explain like what you actually <laughs> sort of see. I know you have posted some yeah. videos to kind of try to visually represent that. So you guys should definitely check out his uh, YouTube channel and everything. So you can kind of, visually see that as well. But I, I guess I'm just curious to help maybe explain that to people a little more. Yeah, like most disabilities, there, there's a spectrum to it. And with blindness, it can get a little, uh, not complicated, but, but yeah, complex. Eyes are very complicated in the sense that there's always these different kinds of uh, visual conditions. Like sometimes people just see tunnel vision or they have black spots in their eyes um, or it's just fully blurry and then with that, you see vertigo and light overexposes their uh, visions and then colors start to wash out. That's how I see personally. And so I can really only start to make out the smallest bit of detail. And it's it's still considered visually impaired like detail uh, when things are about two inches from my eye, which of course doesn't really make sense for me to drive or, you know, even walk without a cane and stuff in most scenarios. Um, so for 385 million people who are considered uh, visually impaired or, or uh, even blind, um, all those people have some form of non-correctable vision. Um, so meaning it can never get to 2020. Either the eyes are just not fully developed or whatever it could be. There, there's something in the filter of the eyes like cataracts or you know, multiple, I'm not an ophthalmologist, I leave that to them. <laughs> but um, yeah, so even though I get this comment a lot, especially because I made a video like, could you be legally blind um, to kind of help people who maybe didn't have that medical information um, relatively available to them. But I'm essentially talking about even if you do have like blurry eyesight, but then, you know, you get your prescription, you see 2020 again, you can go drive. That's not considered legal blindness. It's not even considered like visually impaired. It's just considered poor eyesight um, because medically speaking, Legal blindness is, is when your vision can't be corrected beyond 2200. Um, so something that someone could see who's 2020, about 200 feet away, it has to be about 20 feet away to start to see some type of detail. And that's like right at the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. um, and my vision's actually considered, I believe 20 th over 300 to 20 over 400, um, depending on how much eye strain and time of day and stuff. Uh, so mine varies and that's very much due to the I have a thing called nystagmus where my eyes are constantly shaking back and forth. Uh, and they're just, yeah, essentially they can't focus and uh, they get tired. They, they like to dance all day and then not no, stop. That, that totally makes sense. And then, so one of the reasons that we were thinking about doing this around this time is because of the Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which that is, I believe I have it written down as May 20th. Is that correct? I hope so. That's uh, what the website so. it's telling me, but this is really awesome. So that sounds right. It, it's saying that the purpose uh, is to get everyone talking, thinking, and learning about digital access and inclusion, and the more than one billion people with disabilities and impairments. So I'm just glad that you're kind of here, and not only to sort of talk about this, but just sort of bring more awareness to it because it honestly is something I feel like that is very important. And I feel like you're doing so many incredible things, and I feel like there's probably a lot of people who may have grown up or, or is sort of in this sort of situation. And like, you can still continue on, you can do amazing things. I mean, you're a filmmaker, you're an editor, you're also a gamer, which is amazing. I will never forget when I saw you at E3, I like had a fangirl moment because I had been like watching your videos and I was like, oh my gosh, it's James, it's James over there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, can we get a selfie? I was like freaking out. So definitely it was awesome. But do you want to talk about like playing like video games? Like what are some of your favorite games? 
Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up playing some Nintendo games, uh, for sure. And then I got into PlayStation most recently and that's thanks to some of their business practices they've made with accessibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, but with Nintendo, it's not that they necessarily fully design with accessibility. It's just, they, they have this philosophy to like try and make their games approachable, but there isn't like a level of consistency game to game. It's kind of just like, could my you know younger sibling play this with me mm -hmm. um, is kind of how they think about it, which it does oftentimes benefit people with disabilities or uh, a lot of their art styles in my case are vivid and, and I can visually make things out based on the color because that is one thing I do have is I can make out blurry blobs of color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so Mario, I know he's red, um, you know, any of the, the Goombas are brown. And, and so I'm able to kind of make that out. Um, I'm not great when it comes to like those 3D platformers, but games like Pokemon that were like RPGs that you could take your time with were pretty accessible for me. Um, even if I couldn't read what was happening on screen, I learned the sounds of each individual creature and um, I was able to sort of make out the different uh, time durations of each attack and, and stuff like that growing up. And then as I kind of got more into like console gaming and stuff, Halo was one I had fun with, um, which wasn't good at. Uh, but I was able to see like, you know, red versus blue and that that's what made it that game more accessible to me than something like Call of Duty, mm -hmm. which, which promotes everyone being camouflaged and being more, um, discreet and you know, it's, it's supposed to be more realistic. Uh, so one of the fun things though with Halo, I actually had an eye surgery about the time I was 12 or so and Halo 3 was out, uh, and I had hopped on totally blind. I, I, I couldn't see anything for a full month. Um, I was fully blindfolded. My eyes were recovering, uh, from this, this eye surgery I had and everyone, you know, I, I was a kid. I wanted something <laughs> to do during the day. So I hopped on Xbox live. I found my way to Halo's multiplayer and I started just doing casual games with people and voice chatting and just having fun. And, uh, some of the guys that I'd meet up with would just literally tell me to get on their, um, their vehicles in the back and just tell me what direction to shoot in. And it was just, it was a good time. It was fun. Um, and less of this like kind of toxic negative yeah. nature. I think we, we really associate with voice chatting in games these days, which I often will just leave voice chat off completely with most gaming, unless it's friends, of course. Um, that's really but yeah, great. Those are though. some of like the cool memories I had growing up with gaming. Yeah, that's incredible. I feel like too, cause you know, it's, you never know what you're going to get, especially back in the day on Xbox live. It's, you know, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. you would hear some stuff, especially being a, a, a girl and a female in there. But that's actually a imagine. really, that's a really cool experience. Halo is tough. It so is I'm tough. actually very bad at Halo. And so I don't think I've ever actually gotten better. I mean, it's like all those games are very difficult, but yeah. I think it's at least now, you know, things even like the Xbox, uh, the accessibility, like their controller too, mm -hmm. has opened that up to a whole new range of gamers and things like that. So I feel like these companies are finally taking notice, be like, look, you need to make these games accessible. And I think, you know, for the most part, I think they're doing a pretty decent job, but I feel like there's still more work to be done. Um, is there any specific thing that like you think that these developers can be doing to make things more accessible? Yeah, it's, it is getting better. Um, even a year ago, like really thinking about the progress and, and how much it's accelerated. So many of these gaming companies are hiring uh, accessibility managers, accessibility, like creative directors or, or um, full-time consultants to be helping across teams. And a lot of them are also picking up uh, consultants who are play testing to, and give feedback, to, you know, according to like how they play with their disability. And I had that opportunity with Sony um, with The Last of Us Part Two. That was amazing. And so over mm -hmm. the course of two years, I really got to help make The Last of Us uh, Part Two accessible, which was incredible. It was an amazing experience really watching that game evolve into what it is now where you have totally blind gamers on live stream playing through the entire game, even on harder difficulties. Uh, and and when you think about a game like that, that's like real time and it's supposed to be like this story driven narrative, um, you, you don't think about a blind person wanting to experience that, that story pretty often, but we do. We, we, we like to enjoy games and, and playing that, even if it's a visual medium. Yeah, and I feel like being descriptive as well and, and having people like you be able to guide them to do it the proper way is awesome. Yeah, and I think too, with like the haptic feedback, you know, I wonder if like there's something with there with like the controllers, even like I think there's chairs now that they provoke or that have like the haptic feedback where you can kind of sense like if it's on the left, like there's something happening on your left side. So I don't really know if there's like anywhere that they could improve in that nature too with like that, that type of technology. 
Yeah, there's a lot of things that, they, um, that you know, can continuously be improved upon. I think some type of level of consistency as a publisher amongst games um, is important. We see some developers have it in one game and then they release another title literally like weeks later and that game never actually got the check up on, on accessibility. Um, whereas Ubisoft, for example, has been doing a really great job to ensuring that there's like this, t um, even if the game itself, like the gameplay, because these games have been in development probably for a few years now, um, even if they're not fully accessible with the actual gameplay, at least the menus and navigating that has like text to speech where it narrates that aloud. Uh, and just little settings like that can make all the difference because we can sometimes just use sighted assistance. It's not ideal, but you know, understanding the current state of play, not really intended mm -hmm. to be a pun there. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's just, uh, yeah, that's just kind of how it is at the moment. So you've also done a lot, I feel like, with Apple as well, not only working at the Apple store, which was also exciting whenever I would see you there too. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's James. So hyped. Yeah. Uh, but like, what do you, because I think, because we obviously use phones much differently. And I think that there's so many accessibility features that even me, myself, I've never even kind of dive, like dove into all of the things that are available. For So for you, like how is using the iPhone different? Like what features for you are like key? Yeah, there's uh, two in particular that really make all the difference, and that is voiceover. And voiceover rewrites the way that you like interact with your phone. It's essentially putting a, a filter over um, between your finger and the items on screen, and it puts a cursor that then whatever that cursor is currently landed on, it'll narrate what that is. It'll also tell you what actions can be taken, or if it's, you know, something like a button that is grayed out at the moment so you can't interact with it, then you gotta figure out, all right, well, is there a dialogue box or something? Uh, but yeah, there, there's all these cool things built into the iPhone and, and voiceover is one, and that's been around since the 3GS, since uh, the, and actually on the Mac side, it's been around since uh, the iMac G4 and Tiger. Mm -hmm. So they then ported, they, I think they maybe didn't figure out how to do it right away, the perfect way, uh, when the iPhone first launched, but it did eventually come within about two, two and a half years. So it's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, voiceover can even do things like let you take a photo and have a narration of uh, who's in frame. If it says like one, two people, um, if they're on the left side, the right side, if they're smiling. So it's that's also using things like the neural engine in the iPhone. Um, so we, we hear a lot about the neural engine and, and um, the benefits of that, but it's, it's doing this real time offline encoding where a lot of apps that are doing this like AI um, sort of trying to transcribe what's happening in the world, um, they're sending it to a server in real time. Mm -hmm. And and that server is then trying to do it and send it right back, which, you know, you can argue privacy and, and um, some issues there. But, you know, that's just one way some companies like Microsoft are doing it with uh, an app called Seeing AI, which is really advanced and really powerful. But, you know, Apple is doing a lot of that on your device, which is really cool, yeah. even if you're offline. So I feel like that also would be a and lot quicker, too, if it is on the device. So you're not yeah. sending something up to the cloud and things like that. Exactly. And it's only getting better. Um, and even using things like uh, LiDAR, that's, that's one of the most interesting things that Apple recently implemented into the iPhone Pro, uh, iPhone 12 Pro, mm -hmm. where you could hold up your iPhone in a thing called the Magnifier app. And this is, it was an accessibility feature, and now they actually just made a straight app you can have on your phone. Um, but as you're just zooming in, trying to get a bigger, uh, bigger and better picture of like the world around you, there's a people de detection mode and maybe the iPhone isn't the best use case for this kind of um, feature, but pretty much when you hold up your phone, it's able to detect how many people are there, mm -hmm. how far away they are and narrate and give you different um, vibrations and uh, feedback based on if they're coming closer or, or going further away and narrate that to you as well. Uh, as great as that is, I think that will work better in some kind of hardware that's hands-free, mm -hmm. um, hopefully in the near future, um, if that comes out. Some like sort that. of, you know, but, Apple glasses, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. which yeah. have also been I'm, rumored. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully I'm, they don't I'm take as long as the AirTags. Oh gosh, the, exactly. the AirTags. Well, and you also did a really great review of the AirTags as well. And I think that's something that a lot of people also weren't considering, like how these are different than some of like the tile trackers and like what Samsung has. So what has your experience been so far with the tile? Oh my gosh, I almost called them oh the tile. Gosh. Ah, oh gosh, the AirTags. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, AirTags have been great. I really 
would like a case for my AirPods Pro um, that lets me, you know, slip an AirTag underneath or on it um, discreetly. But AirTags are they're a little big. They are a little uh, big. But hopefully, mm -hmm. someone hopefully makes something that that works. Um, at the same time, they've been great. I mean, I have them on my my cane, my keys. Um, I have one on my backpack or that I just slipped in, and I've used them a couple times now because I I do forget things. I I, I put things down. Um, not just being blind, but I have ADHD, and, and that doesn't really help with where my brain is at all the time and uh, where I put something. So that's been very helpful. And actually, to kind of go back on on what you said, uh, my experience with Tile, mm -hmm. I do have Tiles, but I found that their app wasn't always accessible with mm -hmm. things like VoiceOver. Uh, there was hiccups I ran into uh, quite often. So it kind of made my Tiles a little obsolete to myself. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, investing in this product and then turns out the app it doesn't even fully work for accessibility. Uh, that was kind of a disappointment, but it was nice knowing that Apple had that uh, precision finding feature, which was super helpful. It works very well. We did a little mini scavenger hunt and Tyler, he was hiding them around and hid one like in my coffee maker, like inside of like the coffee beans. Oh. And I was like, oh, this is crazy. I mean, it took me right to it. And like the sound, I will say that my one, it's not even like really a big complaint, but like the sound, it's like a weird echoey sound. So it kind of, I feel like it confuses me. Like it's sort of, you can't really pinpoint where it is because it's like an echo type sound. So I feel like I was struggling to find it because the sound kind of like makes this echo and you can't actually pinpoint exactly where it is. The air tag itself. Yeah. It can't be a worse sound yeah. than the tile sound. The tile is pretty terrible. Like, <laughs> when I hear it in my backpack, I'm like, oh, what is it? It like scares me every time. I'm like, that's so, that's a terrible sound. But it is great. I mean, like the precision finding and the fact that, I mean, it's just like your phone will actually take you right to it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's quite amazing. Um, just being literally guided to it until I can feel it, mm -hmm. so. Mine aren't here yet, so I, I haven't gotten to experience it, but it's okay, I'm excited and I'm ready. And uh, Justine's not sharing? No, but it's okay. <laughs> I can give you the one that, because um, Apple sent like the review unit and there's one that they, they sent with like the letters, like the initials. I was like, who's EWC? I was like, that's not me. That's, yeah, no. And yours, was it, were they like rotate or flipped? So it was kind of like your name? Yeah, like literally had my initials, but then my last name was first. And I'm like, was this intentional? Was it not? Probably I, not, but. I, I think they just enough. put some letters um, on it so you would know. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, WWDC is coming up very <gasps> shortly. Oh I don't my. know if you know any secrets or anything. I know, of course, we're not going to tell, but do you have any like predictions or anything that you're looking forward to as far as, I mean, anything is concerned, really? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know anything. Um, I don't either. I, I know nothing more than... <laughs> 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 um, but there's some things I'm definitely hoping. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love for the 27-inch iMac to get a nice update with um, maybe an M2, an MX, whatever it might be. Uh, chip and then maybe less chin. It's okay to have a little junk in the trunk, you know. I I just the <laughs> iMac with the 24 inch. It had quite a chin. Um, and then even for myself, someone who can see color, but I edit video, black bezel. Mm -hmm. I, I would prefer over the uh, the white. But right now, I haven't seen it. I know nothing, and I want the pink one. I was very surprised by how thin they were. Very so very thin. thin. Yeah, even the headphone jack is now on the side. Yeah. Which is, I just not feel, a bad place for it. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. I feel like, but also then I just keep thinking, I'm like, how easily can this be knocked over? Because <laughs> um, I am, I am a reckless human being. You are. Oh. The one thing that I thought was kind of cool was the the new. Well, they didn't call it MagSafe, but like the magnetic power adapter that then leads to the power brick that has a built-in Ethernet, which is kind of cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. So as I was watching the event, um, we Apple also provides audio description, so a live voice actor who is just like describing what you're seeing that's cool um and they described that like there's four usb-c ports on the back and i'm like okay is that it <laughs> and then i'm like what about my ethernet i always use ethernet now and then yeah what hearing about what they're doing with the power adapter was like really cool I, that i do want to see that more in like future products as well yeah and yeah, i also sure. like the braided cable that they have each one is a matching color to the iMac as well. That's pretty cool. And I think we also need to remember, these are still sort of like entry level M1 Macs. Like this is not yeah. pro grade stuff. So I feel like WWDC is where we're gonna actually start getting, uh, you know, a little more information about what the pros are gonna be coming out with. So I'm hyped. 
you thinking there's a, a Mac Pro with modular M1 component? No, I'm kidding. Well, I mean, yeah, now I'm thinking. Well, no, but remember, Can you imagine. Yet, but, I mean, huh? there were rumors before about the Mac Pro being like one third the size, like a super tiny tower. So that's also a possibility, but also I, like the iMac Pros. True. Yeah. They're definitely going to come Mac out. Mac Pro is see, beefy. It's very beefy. I could see an in between the Mac Mini and Mac Pro, mm -hmm. like some kind of prosumer level where it's like they're could be some modular parts to it, but it's larger. It definitely needs a bigger base. Um, I mean, the rumor was something along the lines of the idea of the uh, Power Cube, Power Mac Cube. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that thing. It was so great. Oh, yeah. I've never yeah. actually held one, but I think only 20,000 were sold. There wasn't many. I don't That's think it was like very low. It is, but it was such a cool device. It was really beautiful. When was this? Um, Around the time this should the G4 know. was out. Let me, let's do a quick hmm. Google. A Interesting. Um, yeah, it was amazing. I've always been very interested in Mac Cube. Let's see. Mac Cube. Release date. Let's. Oh. July 19th, 2000. Wow. Oh my gosh, that was 21 years ago. Stop. That. Well, almost 21 years. Wow. That is. Yes. That's, that's a long time ago. I don't know. I don't know if you hear that. There's a siren going by. There's, you know, been a lot of I'm in the city. crime action. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's, you know, it's Los Angeles, so we, we get it. It's so crazy. So also for you, like working at the Apple store, like what was that like? It was a really cool experience. It was my first job out of high school and it was a very accessible employer. Uh, that's one thing I think um, a lot of people don't tend to realize is that I believe the number is about 75% of blind, and low vision people don't have jobs. Uh, or aren't full-time employed. And this is often just due to employers not, you know, understanding the spectrum of, of blindness or disability or even how to fully accommodate, um, understanding that there's software in like an office setting that, that can just get like a screen reader, like voiceover, but even on Windows or Linux, there are uh, tools out there to, assistive technology to, to make our jobs accessible. And I think a lot of times when people learn that, you know, potential employer is blind or low vision they kind of pass it up um which is you know a shame because there's a lot of us are just skillful and, and we have to learn how to use technology and adapt in different ways um which again just kind of makes us a little bit more well-rounded and, and um, hands-on with it and then beyond that um apple just like all their external and again i can't probably can't talk too much about the internal side of it but like all their external software is accessible. So is all the internal. I mean, that's how I was able to do my job. And, and um, they, they really thought and cared and, and gave that support. So. I feel like the store that you were at too, like on Third Street was such a, I mean, that was like basically like one of the West Coast stores. Like that was like the hub. So you had so many people coming yeah. in and I feel like having tourists and I think, you know, having other people come in who could also, I mean, you're so knowledgeable as well. So it's like, that's really unfortunate for any employers to even like use that against you. So I don't know. I always enjoyed, you know, having you help me out there. So, uh, but it's just awesome that Apple is so supportive and have been really kind of leading the way and kind of integrating this all into everything that they're working on. Yeah. One of the coolest uh, interactions I actually had was uh, with Rob, Rob McElhenney, just casually coming in for some hard drives. Mm -hmm. I got to work with him. Um, and I recognized him by his voice, uh, watching Sunny in Philadelphia, and, and uh, little did I know, eventually, Apple had their um, event, a special March event, I think mm -hmm. it was about two years ago, the, the Apple Card and Apple TV Plus event. And the next thing I knew, he was sitting behind me um, at that event, because they're, you know, him and Charlie Day produced that show Mythic Quest, which is getting a second season next month, too. That's cool. So that was really neat. That's um, actually really cool. That's a fun story. I think Zach Efron too. I helped get him to the Genius Bar. Once. Oh really? That's oh amazing. Oh my gosh! Yeah. And like that again. <laughs> you just never know who's gonna walk into that store. Yeah, you really don't LA, know. LA is interesting. It's that <laughs> it's cool. is definitely interesting. I used to love going to the like the Apple events that they would have in store. You know, that was so oh, yeah. fun. Oh. <sighs> Man, we got to see. Uh, I saw Billie Eilish there. It was towards yeah. the holidays. Oh, that was so amazing. I. Can I just say I love Billie Eilish? I just want to say it again. Yeah, just to put reiterate. it on the record. Put it on the record. The record, let it be known. She's incredible, super talented. I also love her new blonde hair. I haven't seen it. Well, you better get on blonde Instagram. Hair? Okay. I have great. I have it's not green? been. No, it says this is a new recent development because wow. she has a new album coming out. So now oh. she's blonde. Huh. That's great. Well, anyway, I can talk about Billie Eilish all day long. 
But uh, so for you, kind of as a filmmaker, I feel like there's so many aspects to basically creating a film or even just like YouTube videos in, in general. Like what is your favorite part of like the whole process? I think it's, it is the shooting. Um, it's definitely the, the aspect to be able to direct something and, and work with a talented cinematographer who I can relay my vision as a director to, to make this happen, to make this the most visually appealing or, or really just how I'm envisioning it. Uh, and, and, and then just watch it come to life. Um, so that, that's, that's been like one of the most amazing things, but then it's also sometimes just the storytelling aspect of it. I, as much as I love having a budget and, and working with like a crew, it can get very, um, so many layers, right? Mm -hmm. So many barriers then become between you and like the vision and, 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 uh, especially if you're working with a client or, or something, but if you can just kind of storytell something with something as simple as your phone, um, then I think that's sometimes all you need. And, and the best part is like something like an iPhone has an accessible camera viewfinder right there. So if a blind person wants to capture a moment in time with audio and video, it, it tells you how it tells you kind of what's there and hit record and go. Um, which I, I think I, I really want to see like more cameras do that on the market um, from, from these camera companies. It's like you're buying these expensive cameras. The software though feels so dated uh, in many of them. They're, they're functional, but they're lacking a lot of uh, universal design. It is weird because you're, you're right. Mm -hmm. It's like it, the, the software itself feels so archaic. It really does. And I even know. like doing firmware updates, I feel like that's even a process as well mm -hmm. to, to do that. Are there any camera companies that you've worked with that you think either could be doing things more accessible or I don't know, I guess that you've even worked with to, to offer suggestions? Yeah. I mean, I've never worked with any directly. Mm -hmm. um, I've used Blackmagic for a while. I really like their simple user interface. Um, and I think at the time it was just that look I was kind of going for as I've sort of went more into the route of YouTube and, and needing a faster, more accessible workflow. Uh, I've gone the route of like Canon and Canon. I've always been a big fan of their autofocus. That's mm -hmm. especially when I'm, you know, self shooting. That's one of the more important aspects is having good and, and, and consistent autofocus. For sure. And then I've heard good things about Sony. Um, and I know Sony as a company is trying to work towards accessibility more. I haven't, again, worked with any of these companies. If any of them want to try and get some consulting on how to make their cameras more accessible, I'm open to that. Because um, I'd love to really see like my DSLRs, my, my documentary cinema cameras just become more accessible. Yeah, no, I mean, we do so much with Sony and mm -hmm. I feel like their autofocus, honestly, sometimes it's too good. Like when we're trying to take pictures of products, it'll see just a piece of my eye and it's like focusing on, I'm like, yeah. no. So we have to do like this weird thing where we like hold the product up and then we'll just like hide, hide behind it. We hide our face, get the focus and then take it. So, I mean, definitely something to, to maybe look into in the future. But I mean, it's also like all of these cameras, no matter which one you kind of get, like they're they're really good. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I was a Canon person for, for a really long time and they've obviously upped their autofocus as well. So it's just, it is great to be able to just have these devices kind of just shoot for us. But man, the iPhone, like you just really can't beat that, the camera quality. And I love their consistency between the lenses too. Mm -hmm. Cause I think that's something that's difficult for a lot of, you know, other phones to be able to do is get that consistency across the color and like the zoom and everything. Yeah. The software plays a big role with these smartphones to like make them look as incredible as they do with these small sensors. Um, I think they're, they're fantastic wide cameras and they're great for establishing <coughs> shots or just, if you need to get that wide look um, and even some telephoto opportunity, like if, if the iPhone's 2.5 uh, for the iPhone pro, at least um, that 2.5 times zoom lens actually still looks pretty good. And you can set up a shot to, to get some decent bokeh. Uh, it's not great, especially compared to like DSLRs. You can definitely, if you want that kind of shot, you know what camera to go for, mm -hmm. but on the fly, if you just need that for a photo or even, a quick video clip, you can really do some amazing things with just an iPhone alone with those three different lenses. There'll definitely be times where I've forgot to film something and I'm like, oh, I don't want to get out my camera. I'm just going to shoot it on the iPhone. They'll never know. <laughs> and really you can't when you're mixing it in and just doing shots. And as long as it's 
pretty decently lit, like you're not going to be able to tell. But sometimes when it's like too lit is when it looks weird. So it's like funny that the iPhone is sometimes better in like low light. Mm Because I'll notice like, especially in the front facing camera, if I have my like aperture light on and I go to film, I'm like, oh my, I am like way too bright. But then I just, you know, do the little touch and drop down the exposure and it looks good. But yeah, the iPhone in low light is very, very good. Is there something that hasn't been created or that is like way too expensive that you think would be a game changer for you as far as basically like anything, like what would, what would that be? Like, is there something yeah. missing? There is like, so, okay. Cameras being accessible would be great. Like if I could have like a text to speech or a much greater zoom on the operating system mm-hmm. of just our point and shoots and DSLRs and whatnot. But I'd say like one of the more ideas of like an accessible camera would be like a hands-free POV camera. Um, which I know Google Glass did this. I had yeah. a pair myself, but I also understand the concern of like privacy, right? With with the camera having on just your glasses and stuff. Um, so I guess like if I love it though for action shots and and I mean a GoPro is cool. GoPro has that look, but if I could have like a a camera just just on my like regular sunglasses, mm-hmm. um, if I'm you know paragliding or or. Uh, you know, going a little extreme there, but you know, uh, skydiving, I think that'd just be really cool. Um, I've always wanted something like that. And then the idea of, uh, just AI and AR in glasses, um, could play a huge role in, in helping people who are visually impaired, even though like a lot of us wear sunglasses due to light sensitivity, also known as photophobia. Um, we could benefit from like some kind of AI that, that reads signs. It recognizes a sign, tells us how far away we are from it. And, then it just narrates what's on it. Like if it says, you know, exit or, or whatever street we're on. Mm-hmm. That's the one thing. It's like people always ask me whether like I know directions or not. It's like I know my left and right, but I <laughs> I can't see those signs that, you know, you're passing by on the street. So I learned my neighborhood based on the sounds, based mm-hmm. on like the feel of the, the pavement and, um, you know, all that. So, yeah, um, I think something like AR glasses would be really cool. I do not know my left and right and it's have true. not forever. Like I, it's, it's so <laughs> terrible because we'll be in the car and Jenna's like, turn left. I go not go, left. Goes the, go right. I'm like, but that's not <laughs> left. I'm like, but that's the wrong way. So if anybody's driving with me, I like, I have to tell them and they think that I'm like completely joking. I'm like, no, you have to say towards me or towards you, or I'm going to go the wrong way. Like every it's, once in a while I get it right, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, like, well, you use 50% chance. Yeah. I don't know. It's okay. But that, to be fair, I think on a good day, uh, that's when I know my left and right most days though, I'll pretend that uh, I will, I, I do. It's so crazy. It's like, it's like whatever the words you're saying, I'm like, it will not compute. Are you left-handed or right-handed? I'm right-handed. Okay, I'm left-handed. So I don't, I always was like, well, maybe it's cause I'm left-handed. That's why I'm confused. I'm not sure. I'm curious about, um, do you use like, do you use like directions like for walking directions when you're walking around? Do you use like Apple or Google? Is there one that's like better? You don't have to say, <laughs> yes or no, but if if either yeah. of them have like different things for accessibility, yeah, there's a there's a few apps out there. Actually, Microsoft has an app called Soundscape, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. And if you're wearing AirPods or other headphones, what it will do is use 3D audio, and it will narrate if you're like in the city. Uh, you can set sort of a beacon, and this beacon could be like your destination or something that you know you're gonna pass by, and you can hear sort of this like pulse. And it'll be like coming from like, because of 3D audio, I don't know if anyone like maybe listening to this has an experience, but it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's, if you close your eyes, you can literally pinpoint exactly where you hear the sound, despite it coming through like one source. And it's really cool. It, it you can have it narrate different uh, buildings that you're passing. So if you're passing like the H&M or Urban Outfitters or the Apple store, whatever it might be, um, you hear it on that side of your head and you hear it getting louder as you are like literally right by it. And as you go far away, you hear it behind you. Um, so that's soundscape and that's from Microsoft. So that I've does kind of help before. me like, yeah. learn my neighborhood. Um, so that's really cool. And then in terms of just maps navigation, you know, I, Apple maps is it's there. So sometimes I just use it. <laughs> yeah. But same. I'd be lying if I said it didn't get me lost a few times. Yeah. And you're not the no, only one. Apple. No, no it's, it's, you know, that's just, yeah. they could use some improvement. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. But yeah, Soundscape, that's interesting. Google. Yeah. 
There you I go. do <laughs> like with Apple Maps because it integrates with your Apple Watch. So it kind of gives you like that haptic mm-hmm. feedback of like when you're going to be sort of turning. So sometimes it's accurate, sometimes it's not. Oh, sometimes it scares me when I forget I'm driving and Apple Maps is on and my wrist is violently vibrating. I'm like, oh my God, what? And I'm like, oh, you want me to turn. Do you so. often forget that you're driving when you're driving? Did I say that I often forget I'm driving? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> uh, no, me too. All the time. Um, you never know. But no, it's like I forget that I have Apple Maps open and it's vibrating on my wrist. And I'm like, what do you want? I'm like, oh, you're going to turn left. I'm like, okay. So this was something that you tweeted a while ago that I'd never really even like kind of considered. You, you said that during the pandemic, obviously, you know, everyone's not wanting to touch things or, you know, concerned about germs. But for you, a lot of what you're doing and getting around is like tactile. So like, what has it been like kind of, you know, obviously being terrified, everybody's terrified of COVID and then kind of like your main source of getting around has been like hindered from, from basically fear as well. So like, what's it been like for you kind of navigating this whole new world? Man, getting all depressing on me. Yeah, I'm wow. sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> we are on the up oh. and up, which is good. So we're, we're getting better. Still too soon to relive it. Oh, Get my gosh. second vaccine, um, hopefully in the next, I think it's in two weeks. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, we're fully, fully vaxxed back. officially. So very Can't exciting. Wait. Well, I mean, even the booking process, was the booking process accessible? Because I could barely book an appointment. I feel like it was very difficult, but you don't have to I say. I waited a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I, I waited like mid-April to get my first one. Um, just because I know like most were basically taken up. There yeah, were yeah. many appointments. Um, but yeah, I used Walgreens. They were fine. Okay. Their website worked. So. That's good. Uh yeah, so it's been a little difficult. I mean, I personally haven't taken any public transit. Mm-hmm. Or, like, I, I love the train. I used to take the train all the time. Um, the Metrolink also on uh, in L.A. And then um, every once in a while, buses are hit and miss, though. Uh, not my favorite experience. Uh, but I haven't taken one since the pandemic, and mm-hmm. I don't know if I want to jump on that right away, at least this year. I'm hoping to take a train again real soon, but until then... That's been sort of one of the hardest parts is just like that transportation. Now, luckily, mm-hmm. I do have the privilege to work from home and, and um, have those opportunities. Like I've been able to convert speaking engagements or consulting over Zoom or, or other um, web conferencing. And so that that's for the most part worked for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, I, I can't I can't imagine taking an Uber pool again, kind of like. The, the idea sickens me. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's really, I don't know. Even just a, like a regular Uber. I'm like, okay, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't do it yet. Not yet. Not yet. That I've had to sort of swallow. And, and yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely do, way better if it's but. just you. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something. It's just interesting how my brain, like I'm going to be like going on a plane soon and I'm like, Oh gosh, they've, they have opened up. People can sit in the middle seats again. I'm like, what if they touch me? <laughs> like, it's just crazy how my brain is now wired to being just terrified of people. And before this, I was a germaphobe. You know, I was scrubbing those seats down. And now I'm like, Super now that I scrub. know that people don't wash their hands as often as they should, I'm skeptical. You don't want to hear about the men's bathroom. No, never. I don't want to know anything no. that goes on. Any, you know, I mean, I've used them many times because <laughs> the women's line is always so long. So I'm like, it's well, true. all right. I'm Maybe it's because we're washing our hands. It could be. <laughs> Probably. I hope. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, the amount of times I've heard someone walk in and never hear a faucet. Oh. When I hear it walk out. It's gross. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, no, no, uh, no. <laughs> no, moving on. Um, yeah. So but, I, mean, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead. Oh yeah, no. I was just gonna say it is interesting though, like this whole experience um, with bringing up just like being a fear of people, right? Yeah. Like walking and, and and like we live in such a different kind of society and world and, and country, at least for us. That like you never know how someone's gonna react just because you're wearing a mask, even though you're on a walk or something. Mm-hmm. Or yeah, um, and it's like it might be good, or it might be someone who wants to be your next viral Facebook video. And, <laughs> I don't, you know, you never know. I know. You I don't. mean, I'm enjoying wearing the mask. Like I honestly haven't had any type of sickness in the past year. And I usually, you know, I usually get like the cold or whatever every once in a while, but I'm like, man, this is great. And I just roll out of bed, put that mask on. I don't really have to care what I look like. I'm like, this is, this is great. But I mean, obviously trying to run outside, it was a little difficult, but you know, whatever. I'm, I'm totally fine doing what I have to do just to get back to normal and to get people back to work and you know, just have that sense of normalcy again. It kept my face warm in the winter time, so I appreciate that. 
That was that actually was quite nice. nice. Yeah. For sure. Um, well, we we'll, can wrap it up here shortly, but I also was curious, do you have any other creators that are some good suggestions that, you know, we can check out? Yeah. Uh, you know, I watch quite a few within my space and, and, and I was like, what's on my uh, space? Yeah, my yeah space. let's link it. <laughs> I just opened up a can of worms. Oh, uh, within the space of disability and accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, Ricky Pointer, she's really cool. She's a, a deaf creator and, and gamer on Twitch. Um, kind of showing like how she communicates as a deaf gamer uh, with teammates and things like Fortnite and other games that she plays. And then I think, uh, oh, man, there, there's... Um, Juan Alcazar is another one. He's he's another legally blind uh, YouTuber uh, and filmmaker, and sometimes he talks tech. He just talks making videos with with uh, legal blindness. So that's pretty cool. And then the last one, uh, Christopher Hills. He is uh, he's a Final Cut editor. So oh, cool. he, he's incredible with Final Cut, and he never touches the keyboard or mouse. Uh, this because he um, has a physical disability, which he uses this thing called switch control. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. what voiceover is to to blind people. Switch control is that to people who have uh, physical limitations. So it lets him interact with the software, with Mac OS, his phone, whatever it might be, um, with just switches, buttons, things that he can tap with his like neck, with his shoulder, um, move his hand, and, and, and just make it all accessible for him. But he's an incredible editor, has awesome YouTube videos showing how he edits in, edits in Final Cut. and That's uh, amazing. Yeah, just overall, like, great person. Wow, that's, I'm going to have yeah. to check that out. Yes, that's, seriously. I mean, I'm such a huge fan of Final Cut, so it's like any Final Cut editor, I'm I'm down to check this out. It's pretty cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else that you want to add or want to share or have any last parting words for, for the same brain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely participate in GAD, um, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Just whether it's exploring the accessibility features of your computer or phone um, or just joining in the conversation, hashtag GAD, uh, G-A-A-D. Uh, on Twitter, maybe Instagram. I don't know what happens there, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and then I'm starting a podcast myself in <gasps> May. Oh, nice. That's exciting. Called the See Different Show. And I'm talking to entrepreneurs, uh, people who work in the space of accessibility, uh, maybe in entertainment or tech. And we're just talking about how uh, we see different, how we see uh, things in sort of a different way and hopefully enlighten uh, folks around universal design, accessibility, or just um, some motivational stories. So I'm talking with a uh, signed artist uh, with Sony Records who is blind. So she's amazing. And um, then I, uh, the following episode, I'm talking to an audio describer, a guy who literally brings movies to life for, for blind, low vision. So um, that's going to be launching in May. That's so exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah, yeah congrats. That's really yeah, cool. We will okay. all have to check that Appreciate out. Yeah. I'm sure they can find it on Apple Podcasts and everywhere the oh, yeah. podcast Sorry. will be listened to. <laughs> That's yep, amazing. YouTube channel will promote it and, and see different.co is the website. So. Oh, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And make sure you guys all check out James on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, all of the places. And of course, his new podcast. Thank you, James, for hanging out with us. You're the best. It was so great to catch up thank with you, too. I know. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching or listening. However, it is that you're consuming our content. I'm so excited that we got a chance to chat with James today. It was pretty incredible. He's just absolutely incredible human and nice and just doing so much to make, you know, more awareness to the community and to better the community. I have hit the microphone. That's okay, Jen. I'm new. You're new. It's like we've never recorded a podcast before. To be fair, my cord is usually not here. That's true. So anyway, make sure you guys go check out James and everything that he's been posting on his YouTube channel to learn more about him and everything that he's been doing for the community. And if you guys want to leave us a pot, I forgot. Oh, how she's to not do good it. at this. If you guys want to leave us a review, we do accept them on Apple Podcasts. Same five brain. star. Five only. star, please. Unless, you know, no, no, only five stars. Also, we are listening and accepting voice messages on anchor.fm slash same brain. We didn't do them this episode because we had a special guest, special guest. and we didn't want to take away from them. So. Sure. Stay tuned for that in the next episode. And now we'll see you guys later. Bye. Peace.